Robinson Jeffers was one of Cormac McCarthy's most important influences, and in today's video, I'll be going over how McCarthy got some of his major ideas, themes, and writing style elements from Jeffers. And if you keep a lookout over the next couple days, I will be posting videos on modernist influences on McCarthy for the next little bit. So let's hop into the video. The person to pick up the, the baton from these guys and really influence McCarthy is Robinson Jeffers. I talked about this a little bit in my Cormac McCarthy's anti-humanism, but the whole hawk scene that we saw of him mending the hawk, we can link that back through his notes directly to Robinson Jeffers' Hurt Hawk poem. And what... Williams Pound and Elliot brought to the table was sight through a human perspective. We are seeing objects and describing objects from a human perspective, but that's not the only reality. That's obviously a very, very human centered, you know, point of view. And one of the things that Jeffers brought to the table, which I think is the inception of all of McCarthy's kind of writing style, is that instead of speaking from a human, Jeffers started to speak from the elemental world the elemental voice of the planet itself, the solid earth, the actual world. Is the third person omnipotent in McCarthy's novel God, or is it the earth? Because there have been angelic third person omnipotent writers out there before. That prose is much different than the earth-based infernal eco prose that McCarthy's churning out. And Jeffers kind of took up the Whitmian perspective of writing longer lines because Walt Whitman, as I'm sure a lot of you guys know, wrote these very long lines. His theory was that he, you know, someone asked him like, what, why do you do these line breaks? And he said, it's just when I ran out of room on the page. I mean, he just kind of wrote them like sentences. He wasn't even worried about line breaks in his poetry. And Robinson Jeffers took this up and wrote very long lines without that many commas, commas excuse me, very sparse use of punctuation. And that obviously leads to very Cormac approach. And you could, you know, it feels like when you're reading Cormac, you're reading poetry at time and times. And that style of writing really lends itself. Obviously, a lot of modernists were playing around with these really long passages, but that's just poetry. Writing so well that you can force readers to pause without punctuation. And Jeffers, you know, in the early 20s was writing things like this. I believe that the universe is one being. All parts of it are different expressions of the same energy, and they are all in communication with each other, influencing each other, therefore parts of one organic whole. This is physics, I believe, as well as religion. He's already inundated with physics and religion and like coming to the conclusions that McCarthy is, you know, and anyone who was into spirituality and physics come to, you know, that is the quantum revelation right there. And why doesn't McCarthy speak on science? Like we saw the Kukule problem and responses to the Kukule problem, but that was it. We haven't, we haven't seen that much from McCarthy. And I think the reason is, is that one, he's not some like really talented scientist, but he could be putting ideas out there and standing on boards and participating more. But I think that McCarthy really speaks his revelations, his theories, his ideas through his work. Obviously, in a lot of his later works, but still his environmental philosophy and everything in his writing comes through the experience of contact. He, his characters, through their contact through na with nature, expand into the plot, into characterization, death, whatever it is. This is the most apparent in The Crossing, in my opinion. And I think this is what makes McCarthy magical. I think that's what draws us to him because this is a very natural thing. If you spend time out in nature and you make contact with it, there is self-revelation and self-growth. And this is the whole theme of the uh, Cormac McCarthy and Nature Course, so we don't need to get too much into this today. I kind of want to keep this on the modernism streak. And what other note about Jeffers' influence on McCarthy? Jeffers was the king of Western poetry. I mean, he is still to this day. I mean, I, you can maybe throw like a Gary Snyder in there. But for McCarthy, this was the iconic poet out of the West. And seemingly, McCarthy had a fascination with the West. He moved away. I mean, you don't make a move across the country, it, especially if not. He didn't do it for a job. He wanted to move over here and write stories. He wanted to move to Texas. I can tell from the way that he writes. I've traveled a bunch in the West, especially like in The Passenger. And The Passenger, he mentions coming over and seeing the beautiful mountains in Logan, Utah. The you know th These mountains called the Wellsville and Logan, Utah are some of the most beautiful in the world. It's, and McCarthy would have had to travel to this small town in Utah to see it. And we know from um, just certain little tidbits that he is very well-traveled and is very interested in the West, Western United States. Obviously, all his research in the Southwest, but also other areas. And from what I can see from the research and the sources, there aren't that many. Robinson Jespers seems to be the most influential Western United States writer in McCarthy's life. 
Another thing that Jeffers did was that he was not as scared to contact God. I mean, he mentions God. He doesn't believe in the Christian Christian God, but like the ephemeral God, but he's not scared to say God and deal with God within his poetry, even his nature poetry, which is somewhat rare because the Chinese poets, they don't really do this. The the pounds, the those early modernists, they weren't doing this. But Jeffers toyed, as he was saying, that, you know, with that passage we just read, with this all one energy deity that exists somewhere out in the universe. And I'm pretty sure that's what McCarthy would say if you asked him while he was drunk in the early stages of his career, for sure. And we see this wild God. Why are we seeing in these first two parts the the illumination? I mean, is Uncle Arthur just crazy or is there illuminations of the water tank? Are those theological? It's seemingly that's God or deeper energy speaking here. There is mysticism and retribution and karmic consequences and as we're about to see in Outer Dark and um, Child of God. These things are present in his mind, but I don't think McCarthy buys into really Christianity. We've kind of heard that um, we'll talk about this next with Outer Dark, his Gnosticism. But Gnosticism kind of plays into this very well, kind of this idea of the wild God. We know that McCarthy is into Nietzsche, into Schopenhauer, and that whole that whole line, and the and some of the Germans, and that whole line deals with this God's unconscious and the darkness of God. And I think people are very off when they analyze McCarthy with all these like theological and biblical lenses. He obviously knew that because he grew up with it, with it, and I think he went to a Catholic school. Like he obviously knows all this, but he's a clever motherfucker. He's the guy that had all the hobbies and was too cool for school. He is running around, getting drunk with his friends. Very talented kid, though. Re- reads physics, like kind of guys like us and to all my females out there also. So I can't see him really buying into Christianity that deep. And that's his conception of the world. From Jeffers, we also see the indifference of God. I mean, McCarthy, one of these themes is that no one's here to help. A lot of Jeffers' poems have that, you know, either humans or animals suffering, and there's nothing there. And he is very anti-human. He doesn't like progress. He doesn't like the Western tradition, his whole poetic scope is struggling against that. He says, quote, we must uncenter our minds from ourselves. We must unhumanize our views a little and become confident as the rock and the ocean that we were made from. And this is moving back to primitivism. This is the response. So one of the big, I should have mentioned this earlier, sorry, questions in the American eco-poetry space that was presented by um, Henry David Thoreau, and this isn't like anything new, but it was done from an eco angle. They are, who are we and where are we? And Thoreau started the American eco tradition questioning the idea that, that, that we have this transcendental soul that's at the center of abstract rational thought. We are not immortal. We are not these transcendent beings that, you know, Christianity and the like promoted. And Jeffers sees, and I feel like McCarthy does too, that we are much different than that. That we are almost a plague, a virus, kind of moving more into that territory, even within with all of our beauty. And this is crazy, but this is important because this is the modernist revelations at the time. When we finally, when you finally have meditation and awareness and the like, what do you observe? What do you see? You start to see yourself. You start to see the violence being committed. You start to see that's uh, Robinson Jeffers was famous for not going, wanting to go into World War II after Pearl Harbor. You start to see the hypocrisy of the war uh, all around you. And that's why I believe that Blood Meridian is an anti-violence novel. It's, you know, people always talk about the violence and it's always about the violence, but you don't write a book like that unless it's just a massive critique of the whole thing and how humans have turned out in general because he doesn't romanticize the the Comanches or the Mexicans. You know, everyone is bad. What do you think that the Maldamite kid and the kid and the judge, like all these things are symbolizing a design turn though. Humans out of evolution were bad, but we do have a potential to be good, but we have magnified through, in my opinion, mind control by the elite since, you know, thousands of years ago, our violence, our inability to to grow and to think so that we can just remain slaves, you know, maybe not chattel slaves, you know, but people who can never break free and become independent as a organic system. And these revelations may seem easy now, but this is one thing I always have to remind myself. If you, people back in the day, they had no idea, you know, things that we think are very easy to us now, they had no idea. Like Kant, Kant saying there's more than one truth. There's two sides to every story. He proved that in Western philosophical terms. And every single dumb spiritual person knows that now, but they don't realize that really came to be with Kant and Spinoza and all those guys, Heraclitus. And if you said those things at that time, if you said something like a subjective uh, view of morality or ethics or reality, you would get killed. That's some burn at the stake type stuff. 
And I think this lends well. Cormac McCarthy's, I don't want to say conservatism, you know, as his political view now, with this idea that he doesn't believe that humans in general can run a government, can accomplish these things unless we take a path of learning, of growth through nature. But he's too subtle to say some of these things. 